to signal that you would like to make a comment. Your name will be called when it is your turn to comment and the host will unmute your line automatically. Speakers may be, will be limited to a total of three minutes for the entirety of the item. Um, a countdown timer will be displayed on the screen for each comment. Please note, you can hang up and or leave the Zoom meeting at any time. Please adhere to speaker time limit and treat others with courtesy, civility, and respect. Failure to do so can result in your mic being muted or you being dropped from the meeting. And that's it, uh, Vice Chair. Very good, thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and call the call to order to the Local Government Small Business Assistance Meeting for December 11th, 2020. And I don't have any uh, opening remarks, but uh, with that, can we go ahead and do a roll call? Okay. Um, Mr. Aguirre? Mayor Pro Tem Arizmendi? Present. Mr. Avila? I did see him, though. Um, Mr. Blake? Here. Mm -hmm. Mr. Blake, Mr. Campbell, <coughs> Ms. Daniel, Mr. DeWitt, there, Mr. Lamar, here, Ms. Loof, present. Mr. Marquez. Present. Mr. Rothbart. Here. And I see Mr. Campbell is here. With a very festive background, I wish I should say. Happy holidays. Same to you. <laughs> All right. With that, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, look back at the meeting minutes for the November 13th meeting. Anyone have any questions or comments on the meeting uh, minutes? I'll move the minutes. I'll second. Great. I have a motion to second the minutes. Go ahead and take the roll. Mr. Aguirre. Mayor Pro Tem Erzmendi. Present. Aye. Mr. Avila. Hey, Paul, your, your mic is muted. Paul, you give with the minutes. Which Paul? Avila. Oh. Mr. Blake. Mr. Campbell. Aye. <laughs> Ms. Daniel. Aye. Mr. DeWitt. Yes. Mr. Lamar. Yes. Ms. Loof? Yes. Mr. Marquez? Aye. Mr. Rothbart? Aye. Supervisor Rutherford? Aye. And Chair Benoit? Aye. Motion right, passes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll go on to the uh, review and follow-up action items. Derek Alatori, have any action items or follow-up? No, sir, none, none at all. All right. And with that, we can go ahead and go into our first discussion item, the uh, addressing un uh, unassessed chemicals in California. John B. Fass, go right ahead. Hey, good morning, and thank you for the invitation to come uh, share our work with you. Um, so I do have some slides, so um, hopefully we can pull those up. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so good morning. I'm John Faust. I'm uh, Chief of the Community Environmental Epidemiology Research Branch in the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, or OEHA. Um, just broadly speaking, OEHA has responsibilities for providing guidance on health risks from exposures to toxic chemicals. So for our presentation today, I'm going to be joined by uh, Dr. Heather Bolstad, who's a toxicologist at OEHA and one of the, the two leads on the project that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, the other lead is Dr. Rachel Hirani. 
Um, so our presentation today is going to focus on work we're doing to develop provisional health guidance values for the SNAPS program, which is a community air monitoring study led by the Air Resources Board being uh, conducted in communities near oil and gas operations. Um, we've presented this work to the Scientific Review Panel for Toxic Air Contaminants in July and October of this year for their feedback. Um, so the work is still uh, in progress. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what I'm going to do is provide an, an overview of the SNAPS Community Air Monitoring Program, uh, give some background on health guidance values or HGVs and a summary of the problem we're trying to address here, uh, as well as outline some of the, uh, the methods that we're using to approach the problem. Uh, so our, our proposed methods fall into three potential tracks. One is to adopt uh, existing health guidance values or HGVs from other entities. Uh, another to adapt HGVs from other entities, and we'll talk in more detail shortly about this, um, as well as certain other approaches, which we can also uh, cover in a little bit more detail later. Um, so um, the uh, purpose of this work is to identify new HGVs that we can use provisionally rather than adopt formally. Uh, for the specific purpose of screening for health risks from chemicals that are measured in community air. Uh, so these values may change at a later time as new or better information becomes available. Uh, and they may, may also inform more in-depth evaluations that we do on specific chemicals in the future. Uh, this work can also inform other efforts like that, that like the work that uh, uh, CARB is undertaking with new chemicals in the emissions inventory, which uh, Gabe Ruiz is going to be covering uh, in his next presentation after, after ours. So the next slide, please. Uh, so the uh, study of neighborhood air near petroleum sources or SNAPs uh, is a CARB program that aims to characterize air quality in communities located near oil and gas production. Uh, it involves in, intensive limited term monitoring for about 200 compounds in air. Uh, so these compounds can be broadly divided into three groups, uh, criteria, air pollutant, criteria air pollutants like uh, particulate matter or ozone, uh, volatile organic compounds or VOCs, which is a class that includes, you know, uh, 60 simple hydrocarbons like hexane and about 120 more complex compounds like uh, benzene, toluene, naphthalene, and irritants like uh, formaldehyde, uh, as well as approximately 30 metals, including nickel, which has been detected in air near several California air oil fields. So some of the main health concerns associated with these compounds being measured include respiratory effects like the worsening of asthma and uh, concerns for uh, increased risk of cancer. Uh, so the community of Lost Hills near Bakersfield was selected as the, the first SNAPS community. Uh, CARB used a stationary trailer to monitor the air in the town for about a year uh, and completed that effort uh, earlier this year. Uh, the aerial image in this slide shows Lost Hills in the center with the Lost Hills oil field about a mile upwind of the town. Um, Baldwin Hills, a community near the Inglewood oil field in the greater LA area, also uh, shown on this slide, was selected as the second SNAPS community. Uh, monitoring in that community should start in the coming year and will likely include two stationary monitoring trailers, one east of the oil field and the, the other to the west. Uh, so OEHA's role is to prepare the human health risk assessment for each SNAP com SNAPS community based on the air monitoring data collected by CARB. Uh, these assessments will provide information to community members on potential health risks from exposure to air pollutants, uh, particularly those that may be associated with the uh, nearby oil and gas production. So the next slide, please. So just some, some background on health guidance values. So uh, we use the term HGV to mean the amount of chemical, like the concentration in air, which is uh, likely to pose little or no appreciable risk to human health. Uh, these are determined for both cancer and non-cancer endpoints. Uh, non-cancer health guidance values are determined for a specific duration of exposure, typically chronic, subchronic, and acute exposure. 
for example, the OEHA chronic reference exposure level or chronic REL represents the level of exposure below which no adverse health effects are expected to occur if exposed continuously over a lifetime. Uh, acute RELs represent the air concentration without health risk uh, if exposed for one hour. Non-cancer health guidance values are typically derived uh, using a point of departure or POD, which is an exposure level in an animal or human study at which no adverse uh, effects or limited adverse effects are observed. And then the point of departure is then divided by uncertainty factors, which account for potential differences uh, between the critical study from which the POD was identified and the target human population. Uh, these include factors, for example, to account for potential differences between experimental animals and humans, uh, and a factor to account for um, human variability in response to chemical exposures. In non-cancer health risk assessment, the exposure is divided by the HGV to calculate what's called a hazard quotient. And these hazard quotients can be summed to give an idea of the cumulative risk from multiple chemical exposures. Uh, for carcinogens, on the other hand, the uh, health guidance repre value represents uh, the excess risk of developing cancer at a specific air concentration. Uh, and this increased risk uh, can be calculated using a cancer potency value. And the risk of developing cancer for each chemical can be summed uh, to give a cumulative lifetime cancer risk. Uh, so next slide, please. So here, the, uh, the nature of the problem that we're trying to address is that only a fraction of the chemicals measured in the SNAPS ear monitoring study have OEHA health guidance values. For example, of the uh, 200 chemicals monitored in the SNAPS program, only about 30% have an OEHA chronic uh, HGV or health guidance value, and about 12% have an acute HGV. Um, about 46 of the 200 chemicals are identified as carcinogens, and of these, here we're doing a little better, uh, 41 of the 46 have OEH oh, cancer potency values. Um, so having more values would allow us to more fully understand the potential health risks um, that uh, we learn about from this community air monitoring. Uh, so derivation of a new OEH oh, REL or other HGV isn't possible for all monitored chemicals due primarily to uh, limited time and resources, although there may be also, in some cases, a lack of, of relevant data. So a possible solution is a mechanism to provide information in a more expedited manner on potential health risks, uh, which is the process of, of creating and uh, establishing some of these provisional values. Uh, a trade-off, of course, is that provisional HGVs may carry greater uncertainty than HGVs derived through uh, traditional procedures. Um, and I'd also I'd like to add that for some chemicals, the level of uncertainty in developing or adopting a provisional value uh, may be too high. So we are expecting that uh, there may be gaps uh, in what we're able to do. So next slide, please. Uh, so we're proposing two broad ways of establishing provisional HGVs for chemicals without an OEHA value. Uh, the first is to use values from other entities where they exist. Uh, and here we'd either adopt these values as they are or adapt them with some modifications. Uh, for example, a value from the US EPA's IRIS program may be adopted and used while an occupational exposure limit may be adopted with the application of uh, uncertainty factors. Um, the second broad approach is to use alternatives when the, no existing values exist exist. Uh, and here our approach that we propose to use is to use structural analogs. That is uh, how chemically similar is one chemical to, to another that we're trying to understand better. Uh, and there are additional options, including producing in-house ex expedited values or using other predictive approaches that might be warranted in some situations or implemented. We might implement to a greater degree in, in future assessment, ass assessments. Um, uh, so based on the time frame for this first steps assessment, which we're uh, using the data that were collected uh, that ended earlier this year, we're, we're focusing on structural analogs, but for some provisional values, we'll consider other approaches going forward. So 
Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Heather Bolstad, who's going to describe a little bit in greater detail our process for identifying and selecting health guidance values. So, Heather, I think I saw you earlier. I hope you're on. Yes. Thank you, John. Uh, next sure. slide, please. So this slide presents a decision tree outlining our processes to select, adjust, or develop provisional HGVs. Every chemical detected in the communities will go through this decision tree to develop a provisional HGV. Sorry. However, there may be some chemicals where the development of a provisional HGV is not possible through this method. So the first question at the top of the tree is, does the compound have a ranked health guidance value or HGV? And I'll discuss which specific HGVs we have ranked in a few slides. If the compound has a ranked HGV, then that HGV will be used as is or adjusted. On the other side of the decision tree is the process for when a compound does not have a ranked HGV. In this case, HGVs from an unranked data source, that is a source we haven't ranked in our methods, may be selected and may require further refinement. For example, in certain cases, we propose taking the POD from the existing unranked HGV and adjusting it with OEHA uncertainty factors. We'll also discuss this in more detail later. If the chemical does not have an HGV at all, ranked or unranked, a structural analog approach can be used to identify a structurally similar surrogate that has an HGV, as shown in the bottom right box. So in summary, the decision tree includes three main processes. The first is selection of an existing HGV with potential adjustment. Second is development of a provisional HGV based on the POD from an existing HGV. And third is selection of a surrogate HGV using structural analogs. Other processes for establishing HGVs, such as expedited derivation or full derivation, may be more suitable depending on the chemical or the goals, time or resources available. And these processes will be considered in the future. Next slide, please. So the first process in our decision tree was to select and possibly adjust HGVs from ranked sources. But when you have several HGVs for a specific chemical, a hierarchy can be used to consistently select HGVs that are of the highest quality or are the most relevant to the risk assessment. To create a hierarchy, each type of HGV was evaluated based on the parameters listed in this slide. These parameters include the level of external review and public comment an HGV receives, whether an HGV was based on or developed for inhalation exposures, whether the source program is still active and thus able to update their health guidance values, whether the value was intended to protect the general population, including sensitive subgroups, and whether the values are developed following an established methodology. Lastly, the evaluation favored OEHA values over those from other entities because OEHA values were developed to meet California health standards. Next slide, please. So this table illustrates the evaluation of HGVs using these criteria in the context of an inhalation risk assessment for the general population. The top row lists the evaluation criteria shown on the previous slide. The first column on the left lists the source entities and HGV types. So based on this evaluation, as well as professional judgment, we created a ranking of HGVs to use in our SNAPS risk assessments. Next slide, please. So the sources and types of HGVs that we evaluated and ranked are listed on this slide in no particular order. The HGVs come from various programs at OEHA, including reference exposure levels or RELs produced by our hotspots program. They also come from three different programs at the US EPA, as well as the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry or ATSDR, which is a part of the CDC. Also the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality or TCEQ and the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists or ACGIH. As mentioned previously, these values will be adopted, adopted or adjusted for use as provisional values. Next slide, please. So many compounds, however, do not have an HGV from one of the authoritative bodies listed on the previous slide. So in this case, an HGV from an unranked data source may be available. Next slide, please. 
However, this HGV may require further refinement and it may be appropriate to use the POD from that value and adjust it with uncertainty factors per OEHA's REL guidance to produce a provisional health guidance value. The types of uncertainty factors used are listed here and they include one for when there is an effect at every dose in a study and so it's difficult to determine the threshold for toxicity or what we call a no observed adverse effect level or no AL. An uncertainty factor for when the exposure duration of the critical study is shorter than the exposure duration of interest. An uncertainty factor to extrapolate from the animal species used in the critical study to humans. A factor to account for human variability. And finally, one to account for any critical deficiencies in the database of studies for a compound, such as a lack of studies of developmental toxicity. Next slide, please. So we have discussed the first two processes in the decision tree, using and adjusting ranked values on the left. On the, uh, in the middle, a more in-depth adjustment of unranked health guidance values using the point of departure and uncertainty factors. The third and last process is followed when there is no suitable health guidance value. In this case, an alternative approach can be used, and we're proposing to use a structural analog approach, but in some cases when there are available data this may also include in-house expedited development of a provisional HGV. Next slide, please. So a structural analog is a compound with a chemical structure similar to that of the chemical of interest. And the approach is based on the principle that in general, structurally similar chemicals exhibit similar toxicity. It's been common practice in risk assessment to use structural analogs so that chemicals with toxicological data can be used as a surrogate for similar chemicals that are data poor. In this methodology, the first step is to identify structural analogs to the target chemical and software is available that will do this for us. Once the analogs have been determined, the analogs health guidance values will be identified from the same sources discussed previously. The analog with the highest structural similarity score, that is the most structurally similar chemical, that has one or more ranked health guidance values will be selected and that selected analog and its health guidance value will be used as a surrogate in the risk assessment. Next slide, please. So an example of this approach is shown here for M-diethylbenzene with a focus on chronic non-cancer health guidance values. So M-diethylbenzene shown at the top does not have a ranked HGV and thus software was used to identify its structural analogs. Ethylbenzene and isopropylbenzene, shown in the middle and bottom rows, were identified as structural analogs that have at least one ranked health guidance value. Ethylbenzene is the structural analog with the highest similarity score of 1.00, and per our rankings, the OEHA chronic REL for ethylbenzene would be selected as a surrogate to use in the risk assessment. Compared to other methodologies using experimental data for a specific chemical, Using chemical surrogates solely based on structure produces a provisional HGV with lower confidence. However, we believe this approach is likely to provide some understanding of the potential toxicity for otherwise data poor chemicals. Next slide, please. In summary, we expect that this methodology will allow for the efficient selection of health protective health guidance values for many chemicals so that they can be included in our assessment of the air monitoring data in SNAPS communities. Although the use of other entities values or structural analogs is not as ideal as having a REL adopted through our traditional processes, it will provide useful information on the potential health risks from airborne chemicals. Further, this evaluation is likely to identify higher priority chemicals for traditional health guidance value development at OEHA. As John mentioned, we presented this proposed methodology to the Toxic Air Contaminant Scientific Review Panel in July and October, and the panel was generally supportive of the method. We are currently in the process of using the method to select provisional HGVs for the SNAPS chemicals. The selected HGVs will play a critical role in our risk assessment for the Lost Hills community, which is also in progress. Thanks for listening to our presentation and we welcome any questions you might have. Well, thank you for a great presentation. And uh, I think I started to get the idea there towards the end. So <laughs> very in depth, I appreciate that though, very much. Uh, questions, comments from our board members? 
I see a hand raised. Rita, go right, go right ahead. And, and John after that. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Quick question. You mentioned you um, had a meeting in October and it was presented to the committee. Are you having uh, any future meetings on uh, this topic? John, do you want to answer that? Oh, you're John, muted. John, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I turned it off. Um, yeah, well, we do expect to be moving this forward through a public process. So, so the the immediate need that we're filling is to produce a risk assessment for the community of Lost Hills, and uh, we will be bringing that forward through a, a public process where we, uh, you know, introduce what we found to the uh, to the community in particular. But it will also be, you know, available statewide. Uh, for public comment. Uh, so there will be further opportunities for comment, um, uh, at least for the time being with respect to our interaction with the scientific review panel. I believe we, we got feedback from them that we've used to incorporate into our uh, methodology. So using that information, that is going to inform our draft for now. Um, but I guess the, the answer broadly is yes, it, uh, it will continue to be a, a process for SNAPs. John, you had your hand raised there? Go ahead. Yes, uh, on the, uh, the data that you will be using as your, uh, or the sources for your decisions, um, how are you going to be accumulating the data? Well, we've identified health guidance values from many different entities like those shown uh, on the slides from the federal government, various agencies within it, um, occupational health bodies. There are also uh, international agencies that have established standards. Um, but we looked at the, the general quality and confidence we had in the values from these different sources based on how they're derived. So go ahead. Uh, follow up on that is, uh, are you uh, going to be accumulating any data from Lost Hills, the people that live there? That is not part of this study. A previous um, study was done that included uh, surveys of the community. And I think that was done um, by the Clean Water Fund and in partnership with some other nonprofits. But this study um, is only focused on measuring what's in the air in Lost Hills and predicting health risk using that. Okay, so it's going to be projections based on other things other than what's going on in the with the people in Lost Hills? Yes, but the health guidance values that we'll be using are based on studies where humans or animals were exposed, whether intentionally or unintentionally. So it, it comes from actual um, data of the health effects when one is exposed, but we will not be looking at the incidence necessarily of certain health impacts in Lost Hills as part of this study. It's also quite difficult because the town is very small mm -hmm. to have the numbers um, to do an epidemiological study. All right, any other questions? Uh, David, go ahead. I can't raise my hand electronically, so thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, very interesting subject. And in combination with what CARB is doing for a 2588 program, I'm a little concerned as far as using, you know, a structural analog that's gonna ex likely exaggerate the potential risk and how that will be dovetailed into the 2588 program, and we have to start reporting a lot more compounds. For example, uh, what CARB just adopted says we have to look for quantifying or at least estimating emissions of 12,000 12, plus compounds. And most of those are PFOS compounds. So I guess my question for OEHA would be, if we have this whole laundry list of compounds we want to look at, that, that makes sense. But how do you propose to come up with estimates that are reasonable for so many compounds and keep 
in mind that the more compounds we add, the more conservative we are, the more likely it is that we're going to exceed a health threshold artificially, and then a facility is going to have to do, you know, risk reduction and, you know, yell fire in a crowded theater telling their neighbors there's a risk when there may not be. So I just want to bring up that philosophical idea and how you start looking at these additional thousands of compounds to make sure we don't have unintended consequences. Well, I can uh, I can at least start start to answer that question. Um, so I mean I do think that um, you know when we when we are for example looking at structural analogs we are we are being careful about it and uh, certainly putting um, any value that we that we look at across um, different classes of compounds you know very carefully you know from a from a scientific perspective and uh, we're not. Uh, you know, necessarily applying additional uh, uncertainty because of that. Um, but just regarding the the gap in the values for these additional compounds that are that are being folded into the inventory, and uh, you know, Gabe Ruiz in his presentation will will be talking a bit more about their plans for the twenty five eighty eight uh, program. But um, I just want to want to say that. Our, you know, we're, we're creating a, a methodology that can be used to uh, apply to additional compounds beyond those that that we're um, uh, considering only in the SNAPS program. Uh, so, so we think it is a is a mechanism that that we can start to fold in uh, additional values for other compounds beyond those that we're looking at. Um, so it's, it's it's part of a process. Um, I don't know if I have have much in the way of a comment about the, you know, the the potential for cumulative risk, um, you know, that one might reveal by looking further at additional compounds. But um, you know, I think I think it is in the spirit of sort of understanding and knowing uh, what we're exposed to that we're um, that we're building these data sets of of these additional compounds. And I greatly appreciate that answer and understand this is important work and it's good to under, understand what toxicity could come from developing compounds. I guess my disconnect is between talking to CARB and what was presented here. My understanding from CARB was provisional values would not be used to calculate facility health risk. It was just there for informational um, you know, information for information for the public to say, here's what could be coming uh, from a facility and be more proactive as far as allowing facilities to be looking at these type of issues before anything's required. And, and what I saw in your presentation was you're actually looking at developing health risks using the provisional values. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, well, um, I mean, I do want to distinguish the work that we're presenting here from the work that Gabe will talk about shortly um, relating to the, the 2588 process. So, so uh, the, the context that, that we're working on and presenting here is around the SNAPS program. And uh, this is, you know, our, our effort to fill in the gaps around the chemicals that are being measured in the air in the communities uh, community of Lost Hills and try and understand that a little better. Um, you know, the, the decision context in this case is not about, uh, you know, determining whether any, any particular facility is, is, has to do or not do, not do anything. Um, it's more about just understanding the risks that the community faces. Um, so I, I would, you know, sort of defer to the next presentation regarding how how uh, CARB plans to use the provisional values in the AB twenty five eighty eight context. Thank you. Um, sorry, this is Dave Edwards from uh, CARB. Uh, just want to step in, and I, I think uh, Gabe in his presentation will hopefully be able to address some of your questions, David. Um, and thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. Yeah. Great. Uh, Bill Amar, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you. And I'm uh, hi to Dave Edwards. I'm glad to see you, see you on the on this call. Uh, I, I think I think 
some of my the question I had uh, was answered uh, uh, because of uh, David Rothbard's que recent question here. But I, uh, in, in following your presentation, I, I was uh, troubled by the uh, decision tree slides that you have, especially where, uh, where it goes to no. Uh, does a chemical have, have an HGV uh, or a, a source with a point of departure? If you, if you don't have a chemical analog uh, known, uh how is how are you how are you going to how are you going to create one and if and i guess from your answer i guess you're going to uh look to other other data other people's data uh and see if you can find a substitute or, or a surrogate but i know uh, and i don't want to get and you don't want me to get into the eicg regulation but in, in that one, the chemicals in, in that regulation, uh, there are many of them that are, that are new and being added for which I've been told uh, that no one, EPA or any, anybody else, uh, has any idea of, 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 of what the risk factors are, uh, which it raises another concern that we have also about that is uh, is uh, w the uh, the carbs rush? I guess uh, to get these out, even though they've tiered the implementation of it uh, to get this reg out on the street, uh, with, when so little is known about many of the new chemicals. How many chemicals are in your your regulation here for uh, for oil producing wells? Uh, I'm, I'm sure they're they're far less. Uh, than, than those uh, in the universe for EICG? And, and what is your timeline for, for, for this study? Sure, I can at least touch on this last part. So uh, just, just um, to be clear, the, the, the SNAPS uh, program is, is, an, is an investigation. It's not, not a regulation. Uh, so there isn't a there isn't a regulatory element to the program. It's it's to merely understand what chemicals are present in the air in these communities near oil and gas production, um, and the the study was designed uh, with um, with information in mind about uh, in, uh, what chemicals have been uh, detected near other communities of this of this type. Um, so that's the information that, that fed into the decision to look for these uh, 200 chemicals that are part of the current study. Um, so uh, the, the inventory sort of came from prior experience, but um, uh, the, the set is about 200. And, and uh, I talked a little bit earlier about those, those groups. They include a lot of volatile organic compounds, uh, metals, and, and certain criteria air pollutants as well. All right. And, and that raises another question, too. Uh, uh, also drawing a, a parallel between EICG and your study. Uh, I know CARB intends to have the chemicals and EICG uh, put on their website. Uh, and, and when you say, when you mentioned here that uh, one of the goals or maybe the goal of your study is to, uh, is to uh, find out how, uh, what chemicals uh, are detected in, uh, in the surrounding communities uh, and, and, uh, and how, how does that uh, play out in risk to the public. If that's going to be made public, uh, for public consumption, that's going to scare the hell out of a lot of people, uh, you know, based on uh, maybe some, some sketchy uh, assumptions on, on your part, especially with these chemicals that, that don't have uh, values. So one thing I would say is that um, we're not making sketchy assumptions for the surrogate approach. Uh, there's a 
similarity threshold of 0.8. So one being um, essentially identical in the software that we use. So there's a threshold for um, the analogs that are identified. And then we only look for values from authoritative bodies for those most similar compounds. And if there isn't a ranked value from one of those analogs, we would not have a value in the methodology that we're using in SNAPS. What CARB is going to do for, for the EICG, I can't comment on, but the methodology we developed for SNAPS, we've tried to eliminate any you know weak, weakly founded assumptions. And 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 did 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 one of you mention what your timeline for completing this is? The risk assessment for the Lost Hills community will uh, come out uh, the first part of next year in draft form for public comment. Okay. And 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 I guess Baldwin Hills would be almost a year in in the in development then. Uh, yes. So COVID kind of impacted some things, but um, <laughs> monitoring should start next year. And they've already been in the um, site selection process and received public comment on their location of um, the monitors. And they're proposing two, one, one on the east and one on the west side of the oil field, because sometimes one side is upwind and sometimes it's downwind, depending on prevailing wind. Thank you very much. Rita, you have another question? Yes, I just wanted to um, echo the uh, the comments and concerns from both uh, David and Bill. And I guess, you know, if I can, I, I think I know what Bill was trying to say, not to, you know, say that the process is sketchy, but rather than the methodology, it's sort of a new methodology. So even though chemicals, uh, you know, might look similar, and it was kind of fun to see chemical structures. I haven't seen them since I graduated from UCLA, so <laughs> brings me back. But just because chemicals have similar chemical structures uh, does not mean that they're going to behave in the same way. And especially when you're talking about, you know, emissions. And I guess my concern uh, not knowing too much about how the process is going to play out. Uh, but like David mentioned, it's how it's going to be implemented in things like the uh, CARB regulations that we're looking at, where all these new chemicals are coming in to, to play a role. Um, so that's, that's uh, sort of where I'm coming from. So the use of structural surrogates has recently come under new names like read across, but it's been used for over 50 years, like for the dioxins and the PCBs. Not every single one has been tested. So a lot of our assessments and regulations are based on the similarity. So it's, it's a pretty well-founded toxicological principle that structurally similar compounds exhibit similar toxicity. Of course, there are exceptions and you know, we, we keep those in mind and um, are really seeking for the best possible answer with the data we have. Todd, you had your hand raised. Go ahead, Todd. And then David. Thank you, thank you, Chair, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yep, Sometimes go ahead. I like to just to make sure. Um, first, first, I wanted to uh, I thank John and Heather for a great presentation, and uh, I was wondering. I may have missed this because uh, we're we're homeschooling and sometimes I get a little distracted from time to time. But uh, you are doing just these two sites. Uh, are you doing other sites in the future? Or are you going to use these sites and extrapolate to other communities that? Uh, so the, have, the uh, oil oil and you know and gas production. The plan in SNAPS is to do monitoring in one community a year and then an associated risk assessment for that community. And the goal is to alternate between uh, essentially the Central Valley and the Los Angeles area. So the third community will be McKittrick and Derby Acres, um, which are towns also near Bakersfield, 
and they're kind of combined into one because they're very close to each other and next to the um, McKittrick oil field. And then after that um, was going to be the uh, South Los Angeles or, or Jefferson site. Um, so those were the original communities selected. So <clears throat> do you envision that you would ultimately, once, you're, once you do those, you'd continue or would you just think that you have enough of a data set to kind of understand uh, the impacts enough to, to be able to extrapolate on other um, sites like Hawthorne or, you know? Yeah, um, I mean, I definitely think it'll be useful for extrapolating, especially because uh, there are many studies uh, on the health impacts of oil and gas development, but they're out of Pennsylvania and Texas and Colorado, where not only the geology, but the practices are different. Right. So yeah, and I, I would imagine our practices are a little cleaner or, or tighter. Yeah, correct. Um, well, and just whether the, the wells are horizontal or vertical and, and yeah, okay. that sort of thing. So, so it will be very helpful to have this California specific data um, I'm not sure what the plan is beyond those communities, if there will be a reassessment, but the plan right now is to do it, uh, a new community every year. Okay. And I guess I'll, I'll take a slightly contrarian view. Um, I appreciate the fact that you guys are uh, anticipating and calculating uh, what the communal risk would be associated with a uh, amalgamation of chemicals. Uh, and I know that, you know, unfortunately, uh, our knowledge of chemicals is, is obviously limited. That's why we have an Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment uh, to continue in that work uh, to better understand it uh, as best as the science allows. But um, from my perspective, even though <clears throat> I come from the business community, I also formerly came from the environmental community and I live within uh, less of a mile from a refinery. Uh, so I, I care and I would rather have you be progressive and um, over overestimate the risk, you know, obviously not blow up the risk, but overestimate it enough to, to feel confident, have a, con a high confidence level that you understand it, uh, you know, according to the science. And I just want to thank you for your hard work. This is, this is really helpful and things that, you know, this is something that we need, especially as we become more dense uh, of a population, uh, which, you know, clearly that's, that's, the, that's the inevitability. So, um, thank you for, for your service. We really appreciate it. Thank you. David, you have another question? Real quick, a question regarding the structural analog process. Is this something where there's been some type of review of, you have something that's well known that's been characterized uh, and then use the structural analog to say, we assume it has a similar toxicity has that been validated in the past? I'm just trying to get an understanding of how robust the structural analog process is. Yeah, I think that it's a principle that's been well-founded and US EPA has developed uh, regulatory values based on analogs, um, rather than just not evaluating the risk from a compound using information they have on whatever is most similar. And it's necessary, especially for classes like PFAS, where they're, you know, depending on your estimate, 300,000 different compounds of which a fraction have been tested. So um, it is well-founded. I could find studies um, to validate it, that, that validate it and to share with you, but it's, it's um, like I said, it's, it's been part of our, our field for a long time. Um, and we know and have in mind the cases where it may not apply. So like hexane is an example of a hydrocarbon where it has some unique neurological effects. And we know that heptane has less so, and it's just because of the carbon link. So we have those things in mind. This isn't like a blanket blind approach that we're taking. I appreciate that. I think the PFOS is really unique. I represent the waste sector. So if we're looking for something that could be there and there's no analytical methods, it, it becomes this complex process of, well, there could be thousands of compounds. And if we're so conservative, we may not have a realistic response if we're too conservative. 
you know, for one or two compounds, uh, I, this process makes sense. But you have thousands, thousands and thousands of compounds. I'm worried about unintended consequences. So just wanted to keep that in mind. So thank you very much. Very good. That's all the hands raised I see. Uh, again, Heather and John, thank you for an excellent presentation. And uh, I think we all have a much better understanding of where you're coming from. And we really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. Sarah Pinoy, did you want to check if there were any public comments or questions? Sure. Any public comments on this item? And it sounds like there's a train whistle somewhere. Not seeing any hands raised on the public comments. If you're on the phone, hit star nine. And uh, I think everyone, pretty much everyone's on Zoom at this point. And uh, hit the raise hand button if you wish to make a comment. Not seeing any. All right, we'll go ahead and go on to our next item. Thank you very much again. And uh, the next item will be the uh, using provisional health values. Uh, Gabe, go right ahead from Carbs. Gabe Ruiz, thank you for joining us. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, participate in today's meeting. Um, my name is Gabe Ruiz, and I am the manager of the Toxics Inventory and Special uh, Project Section at CARB. One of the main responsibilities of my section is overseeing the implementation of the Air Toxics Hotspots Program. Uh, my presentation today will cover the use of uh, health guidance values in, in the Hotspots Program. I will start with a general overview of the program and then walk you through the program requirements and how we intend to use uh, provisional health guidance values. Uh, next slide, please. Assembly Bill 2588, or the Air Toxics Hotspots Information and Assessment Act, was signed into law in 1987 to address public concerns about potentially significant exposure to toxic pollutants emitted by facilities. It established a public right to know program by, for air toxics by creating a process for facility operators to estimate toxic emissions, collecting data and making data available to the public, identifying facilities that may have localized impacts and mass conduct health risk assessments, and outlining a process for facilities to do public notification and reduce risk impacts. Next slide, please. AB 2588 uh, sets uh, specific requirements for CARB, OIHA, and the local air districts in the implementation of the program. CARB's roles include making emissions data available to the public. Uh, we have done this through our website, facility emissions query tool, and as well as an interactive mapping tool that the public can use to geographically look up emissions data. CARB is also required to maintain a list of chemicals that may pose health risks when present in the air. OIHA's roles include preparing risk assessments guidelines, reviewing health risk assessments, and developing health values for toxic chemicals. These health values are peer reviewed by the state scientific review panel on toxic air contaminants or SRP before being finalized. Air districts implement the program at the local level by conducting facility prioritizations, overseeing the health risk assessments, public notification and, and risk reduction efforts and publishing annual reports of their AB 2588 implementation. Next slide, please. The uh, AB 2588 process starts when the facility operator conducts an air toxics inventory according to the emission inventory criteria and guidelines or EICG uh, developed by CARB. Using the inventory data, the local air districts then prioritize each facility to determine whether a health risk assessment must be conducted. Facilities can be classified as low, intermediate, or high priority. Low priority facilities are not subject, are not subject to further requirements at this point. And intermediate priority facilities are required to do uh, quadrennial updates of their toxics inventories. High priority facilities must conduct health risk assessments according to methods developed by OIHA. Health risk assessments are reviewed by, o by OIHA and approved by the Air District. And based on the results of the assessment, 
Air districts then classify facilities as low, intermediate, or high risk. As with the uh, prioritization scores, low risk facilities are not subject to further requirements. Intermediate risk facilities must do quadrennial inventory updates, and high risk facilities must notify the public of the significant risk and are required to take further steps to reduce the public exposure to air toxics. They must conduct a risk reduction audit and develop a plan to implement air toxic risk reduction measures. Next slide, please. As was illustrated in the previous slide, uh, the OIHA approved cancer potency values and non-cancer reference exposure levels are used in two critical steps of the AB 2588 process. These are prioritizing the facilities to determine which must conduct health risk assessments and as inputs to health risk calculations. And I guess uh, I'll make this uh, pause to um, address one of the questions that was raised earlier about the uh, provisional health values. So uh, in the uh, 2588 uh, process, we only use uh, OIHA approved official health values. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Last month, uh, our board approved amendments to the EICG regulation that will add over 900 new chemicals. These are individual listed chemicals to the substances that must be reported. In addition, there are three um, substance uh, groups uh, defined by the functional groups, which uh, is the 12,000 that uh, David Rathbard uh, alluded to. Most of these new substances do not have approved OEHAD health values. And in fact, uh, only slightly more than half of the substances currently on the list have approved health values. As John and Heather pointed out in their presentation, establishing health guidance values by traditional approaches can be a very time and resource intensive endeavor. Uh, therefore, we are partnering with OIHA to piggyback on, the, uh, on, the, on their efforts that uh, they uh, presented today to develop provisional non-regulatory health values for the AB 2588 program. Next slide, please. Our purpose for developing provisional health values aligns with the goals of the hotspots program to identify facilities that may have localized impacts, assess the risk to public in health, and reduce this risk to levels that are health protected. Provisional health values will help CARB, air districts, and facilities better understand the relative importance of processes and emissions at the facility level. Facility operators can use this information to make informed decisions regarding voluntary reductions with assistance from CARB and the air districts. Additionally, OIHA can use this information to allocate the resources for the development of approved health values based on the provisional values and the amount of emissions reported for these new chemicals. And lastly, I really want to emphasize the importance that these provisional health values would not be used for official facility prioritization score or health risk assessments under AB 2588. Instead, a more likely use could be an air district using these values to do an analysis of potency weighted emissions as they consider whether a facility should be exempted from reporting requirements, you know, if there's a, a reason for concern. Next slide, this. <clears throat> the next steps on this project include continuing to work with OIHA to adapt uh, the methodologies discussed earlier by John and Heather to further refine the proposed approach that we presented to the uh, SRP in July of 2020. We anticipate going back to the SRP with a final proposed approach by mid to late 2021 and we will continue working with our OIHA partners. Uh, and we anticipate uh, that provisional health values for some substances uh, might start becoming available by early 2023. Um, and 
the uh, uh, we have not yet created a specific list, but uh, that's something that we are planning to work on over the next uh, several months. Next slide, please. This concludes my presentation. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have right now, or if you prefer, you can also contact me or Melissa Travers of my staff at the uh, email addresses provided on the screen. Thank you. Great. Thank you for those uh, emails. And uh, if you do see a question, uh, David, we want to go right ahead. Thank you. Gabe, thanks for the presentation. I really appreciate it. We've been talking about this for a long time, but I, I think my disconnect is seeing OEHA's presentation where it seems like the provisional health values, maybe not under 2588, but under some program would be used to estimate risk. It, and if that is done in one location, you know, if I'm a member of the public and I'm concerned about a facility next to my home, I'm going to say, well, you use that for Kettleman City. Why wouldn't you use it for me too? I'm just worried about setting a president and, and what the ramifications are. Uh, and not sure what your thoughts are, but I just wanted to bring that up since that's different than what we've talked about in the past. Yes. Uh, so I, I would point out that, uh, you know, uh, health risk assessment, um, under AB 2588 is very clearly uh, specified in the statute, you know, that we, we have to use OE has uh, approved values. So uh, this exercise to get information on new chemicals, I mean, it's really intended to um, help us prioritize those chemicals that need you know, further review and maybe move to the uh, top of the list by OIHA as they um, as they work on uh, developing the official health values. So I don't. I, I think it probably would take uh, some um, change in state laws for AB twenty five eighty eight to start using any values that are not fully vetted by OIHA and the SRP. Thank you. Appreciate that. Rita, go right ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ruiz, for the uh, for the information. And I guess I just wanted a clarification on what was meant by the uh, non-regulatory provisional health values. I think you cited an example that it would be um, used for looking at whether or not something is brought into the regulatory scheme but in my mind, that's sort of a regulatory decision. Whether or not to regulate becomes a regulatory decision. So AB 2588 um, basically um, says that local air districts are in charge of implement implementing uh, the program. And CARB is uh, charged with developing the guidelines, uh, in this case for emission inventory uh, reporting. Uh, but when it comes to, uh, you know, doing prioritizations, uh, determining which facilities can be exempted from further reporting or which facilities need to be brought back into the reporting uh, for the program, that's a decision made by the local air districts. So all, what we are doing with our regulation is basically just adding, uh, a, well, we're adding more chemicals that need to be considered uh, and reported when there's information on, on their emissions or when there are quantific, quantification uh, procedures for those. Uh, but it's really up to the districts uh, to take a look at these provisional health values and then determine whether a facility that is emitting one of these newly listed chemicals for which we don't yet have a formal health value. But if they're emitting these chemical at, uh, amounts that are significant enough to be of concern, we're just giving them the flexibility to say, you need to stay in the, in the program and keep reporting these emissions. And, and at this point, there's no additional requirements. I mean, uh, we just need to keep track of those emissions once OIHA determines or, or develops official health values for those, then uh, the facility would move into the next step, which is prioritization 
and potentially health risk assessment if those uh, emissions are at a high enough uh, level you know, to, to create a local impact. It looks like uh, I don't see any other new hands raised. Anyone have any other questions? Again, Gabe uh, shared his email address. So if anyone does have any future questions, you can please go ahead and email him. Gabe, thank you again for the presentation. Great job. Sure, and, thank uh, you. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you. All right, anyone else? Uh, I don't see any other hands raised. We're gonna go on to the, uh, the Local Government Advisory Small Assistance Group, uh, our 2020 uh, accomplishments and items for next year's goals and objectives. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Um, so this is uh, this was uh, our achievements, our accomplishments for 2020. Just a couple of the uh, of the significant ones. Uh, we uh, gave a presentation on facility-based mobile source measures. Additionally, gave one on emission reductions and air quality impacts from COVID. Uh, the hearing board, uh, the chair of the hearing board came in and gave a presentation on the hearing board and what they do. Um, and then additionally, another one of the highlights is an overview of CAPCOA. We had Tung Lee come in and give that presentation. Uh, in the in what was uh, in, in the agenda packet that was sent to you, we also have a list of proposed goals and objectives for 2021. I won't go over all of them, uh, but we are open to any additional suggestions that you would like, um, either you can let us know now or email, email us before uh, the end of the year so we can include these. Um, and with that, uh, Vice Chair, that's all I have on this item. All right, anyone have any uh, verbal items they wanted to throw at Derek right now? Rita, I see your hand going up, go right ahead. Yes, I have three. And I, know I one. apologize, I'm sorry. I know one of them. <laughs> okay, I'll start with number one and let's see if you're reading my mind there. Okay. <laughs> um, it would be number 10 on the list of the proposed goals and objectives, which is the uh, rule 219 update, comma, if available. Right. Um, and I think that it is available now, and I'll share the, the concern with, that has come to my attention, that now we're seeing in our industry um, hybrid systems where the UV, like the, uh, we have a couple of companies, one out of state, but one in California, um, that is converting part of their operation to UV, but they're not changing the entire thing. They want to kind of, you know, dip their toe in the water, see how it works out, rather than having to convert the entire facility. But they are converting part of the facility or part of the uh, the coatings line to UV. Uh, so they're getting emissions reductions from that portion. But because they also have a solvent system, the solvent system is acting as an anchor to the UV and it's bringing them into the permitting system so that they're forfeiting their 219 exemption automatically just by virtue of being associated um, with a solvent system at the facility. So I would like to see a report, um, much like the small business assistance report format of basically how many permits have been issued in the last couple of years, last 219 amendment. Uh, because we knew that last 219 amendment was going to be problematic. That's why we expressed a lot of concern um, at the time, because it was going to add a lot of confusion. The way the language was changed uh, with the staff proposal uh, was going to add a lot of confusion. The staff recognized that by saying they were going to do outreach to the industry uh, to explain further how the rule was being implemented. But the the it seems that the confusion is still out there so i would like to see a report of how many facilities have had to um apply for permits and not been 219 exempt and i'm specifically referring to the uv and ev facilities so rita can we do this instead of a report can we just uh i'll ask um our permitting staff to 
uh, get that report? Can we just send it out to everybody on local gov rather than give a presentation on that? Is that okay? That would be okay with me. Okay. That would be okay with me. I don't know if it's okay with the Brown Act because that's sort of like using an intermediary of a staff person to send out to the committee and therefore the public doesn't have the information. So you might want to check internally on how yeah. the process should play out. I'm not sure who's on, on from legal, but I think it could be included. It's, it's no different than a request that you, that local gov makes uh, and we do the action item and we send out the information. So, but I'll check with legal to see if there's a, if there's an issue with that. Okay. So my, um, my other one, um, was in regards to interaction with the uh, administrative committee. And I think our chair, thank you, Mr. Benoit, for representing this committee and its importance to the admin committee. But I always hear Dr. Burr make a comment that, you know, it's a report. He never sees the committee. Um, I, I don't want to say that the implication is that we are a do-nothing committee, but we just don't have a presence to the admin committee. And I wondered if, because um, I think staff does a great job and I guess, you know, staff has accomplished a lot more than committee members have accomplished in this report. Um, and it's more of a, of a passive committee in the sense that we're just hearing information from staff. I would personally like to see it more as an active committee and especially now in light of the fact that the uh, Home Rule Advisory Group is no longer meeting, I think, you know, some of the members of this committee, like David and Bill, that were on Home Rule Advisory have lost that kind of, you know, communication um, uh, device, if you will. So i think you know i would want to see us having as a goal that at least once a year maybe one of the members of this committee not staff um goes to the admin committee to kind of do you know a two-minute chat about this is what our committee is working on and issues related to our committee so that's an idea that i want to present to the rest of the committee for, for thoughts. Well, I guess my question would be, was that something that Home Rule used to do would to go to admin committee? I don't believe Home Rule would do that or, or used to do that. So, no, I, I, go ahead, I'll, I'll defer to the Home Rule members. No, Home, home Rule uh, reported to the Stationary Source Committee. Did they go to the committee though and, and present? No, 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 uh, no. We, typically, we our, our chair, uh, like yourself, uh, what was a, um, uh, you know, what was on stationary source, right? So, uh, so, so there was that that link there, that that well, connection. And, and just like that with admin committee, I'm on admin committee. So, you know, Rita, I see your, I, I mean, and. And I know Dr. Burke has raised that comment a couple of times about the report that's attached, but I have been there to remind him that this is an active committee and we, we do look at things. And I even reminded him of the a letter this body sent uh, last year um, yeah. to, the, to the body and, and raised those concerns. So I, I believe it was, yep. Derek, you have something you want to add? No, yeah. In, in, in fact, I was, I was going, I was going to save this for public comment, but, since Rita brought it up and, and you're talking about it, uh, about a month ago, I, uh, I, 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 I sent uh, you and, uh, and Tom an email because I think it was at our October local government meeting that I had, had asked uh, what is the, uh, what's the status of, of home rule because we hadn't met for over a year. And uh, I believe my recollection is you are going to send a, uh, get in touch with somebody, uh, Phil Fine, with someone to see uh, about setting up a meeting. And of course, uh, we haven't had one in November or December. Yeah, I'm still working on that, Bill. And, and that's something, a conversation I had with Wayne, and we're told, trying to figure out where we're going to go with that and what, what the plan is. And I, I apologize oh. that it slipped again, but it is something I, I do want to see us either combine some of those features of home rule to this body or 
or something. So it, it is a conversation Philip, Dr. Fine and, and Wayne and myself still need to have some more future conversations on, but um, you know, it's something that either we're gonna to rectify in some way, but I, I'm working on it. No, oh, thank you. So Mr. Chair, I, I'm perfectly fine with your representation if you wanna, I, I think you're a good representative of the committee. I wanted to give you some support if we could from the member, but you know, I'm perfectly fine doing it uh, that way. Uh, my concern would be if somehow, you know, there was a perception that um, the committee was not really functional and it needed to be deleted. That's that's where I'm yeah, I, I don't think Dr. Burke uh, completely felt that way. And if he did, I, I've had, again, some further conversations with him and he, he now understands a little bit better what was going on there. But I, I think Eric, he, a court comment? Yeah, so his comment, if I recall, in committee a couple times was not so much that he wasn't aware of local gov um, isn't active it was why does derek need to come to admin committee to give a written report and that's all it is why why is his name on the agenda why not just give us the written report and i think that was more about his comment than anything else and, and if anyone doesn't know the, the chair likes to sort of poke at derek a lot and, and pick at him so that was just more of that comment on that i think than anything <laughs> that's absolutely what that was yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> It wasn't a, a necessarily pointed at us, but just more at Derek. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's good to know that we don't have to take it personally. <laughs> yeah. so, we'll, leave, we'll leave that to Derek. <laughs> okay. And my last one was a question for, for David. In light of the conversations that we just had on the presentations on the uh, EICG and CTR and the activities of CARB. Now, I know that the district is um, you know responding and ma uh, making public comments to these regulations. Um, but my my thought and my question for you, David, is would it be helpful? And I realize we're not going to agree with the district on everything, but on areas that we do have common ground on, would it be helpful to support the district uh, by sending like a support letter? from this committee, taking a vote and sending a support letter, a position letter from this committee as part of that process. So I think, uh, is, I'm not, is Elaine is legal on, on the line? Cause I, Hi. Yeah, go ahead, Daphne. Uh, um, well, I mean, I think that's a question to be answered. It's a short question, so someone can comment. And then I don't know if you want to put on agenda later in terms of discussing what the committee wants to comment on or provide. Right. So this is this has been brought up before, Daphne, and I think before you started when Nancy was here. And if I recall correctly, Elaine, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't she say it was in Nancy's position that um, the organization or the the uh, the committee as a whole cannot write a letter of support for an item but rather as individuals they can go ahead and submit a letter of support for items is that what is that what Nancy said do you recall I well I, I don't recall that that much but I do recall that as a group I think they can um, we did change the charter okay. and we have and it can be presented to um, okay. the next committee. Did, didn't it have to be unanimous? Wasn't that the, the sort of the caveat that was added or something like that? Yes, I can look at the charter. Uh, definitely believe it also sent. Yeah. Why don't we go ahead and look into that? And then yeah. Elaine will send out a, a, an email to, to, to the committee members. And well, also, I, I think it might depend on how the letter is drafted because obviously the committee could provide certain facts or concerns and raise that versus a, a specific opinion. So it might depend on what exactly is crafted in the end. Yeah, and then once that's, you know, so I guess uh, back to Rita's point, if we could put something towards that on the agenda, Derek, to bring that forward uh, regarding the issues that David has raised. And then it's a matter of what facts we wanna be a part or put in that letter and then you know, something we all can agree on I guess the other was the other caveat but let's at least put it towards the agenda to, to work towards that if, if if that would be something david wants and i appreciate that and I, my only suggestion would be we've heard from oeha we've heard from carb i've talked to south coast staff 
and they may have a different set of concerns. Um, my suggestion would be maybe the next meeting or whenever that could be agendized, see if staff could come in and interact with us and see if we all can agree on a, a way to help South Coast staff. Maybe we can start there, Derek. Yep, sounds good. Okay. John, I see your hand raised there, go ahead. Oh yes, a very serious uh, point of view is that we've missed our meeting at the Basque restaurant. And I want to know if, there, if within your goals, are we gonna do that when we can meet in person, when we get past all this other crap? So that is out of, that is out of my uh, <laughs> wheelhouse. Uh, that's, uh, I think that's uh, the, the powers that be up above in the sky, but I believe that would be a fair assessment to say that once we get over this, you know, uh, whether it be this year or, I'm sorry, next year or the following year, uh, it's up to the chair whether he wants to have it there. I, I would, I would say, I would sure hope we can do that next year and uh, when, when it's when it's appropriate. But uh, I will say, we were far more productive having a regular meeting this December than we usually are when we go to the the restaurant. <laughs> Not all production is measured on <laughs> an agenda. Very true. Very true. <laughs> All right, Bill Lamar, I see your hand raised. Was that from earlier, or did you still have one more comment you want me? No, I, I, I wanted to make some suggestions for the 21, 2021. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. I also wanted to, uh, to, to build off of, of John's comment by saying that lunch at Bill's Diner here in Anaheim isn't anything like lunch at, at, in Diamond Bar uh, for local government small business, so I, I miss it. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, I had I had three suggestions, but I see one is already there, and and that was the AQMP. Uh, I'm I'm glad to see that uh, item B information on the progress in meeting the 2023 attainment deadline uh, at the at this morning's ledge committee meeting. Uh, the, uh, the 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 sinister phrase. Section 185 fees came up uh, because it, it appears that we're not going to meet uh, the mobile source strategy uh, for that, and uh, that's that's uh, has a potential to adversely affect uh, many many businesses. Uh, so uh, I would I would hope that uh, we could stay on top of that this year. Uh, the other the other one is that. Uh, I would like a, uh, 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 to propose that we have a primer or get a better understanding of the district's compliance and enforcement policies and their program, uh, a better understanding of that, uh, how, how inspections are conducted, how fines, uh, fines are, are assessed uh, and uh, 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 and, 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 and include the FIND program, F-I-N-D, uh, how, how certain violations or, or notices to comply find their way on, how long they have to work themselves off if they ever do. And then finally, uh, I would like to propose that we have a, uh, an update on the uh, two presentations we had today, only later in the year, uh, maybe, to, maybe about this time, uh, next year, uh, during the October November time frame, uh, because uh, I, I think that would give that would give the uh, uh, the C carb CTR EICG regulations uh, uh, some uh, some time to take hold and and see how uh, their outreach and and the district's outreach uh, is is going to. Uh, if, if that's going to be fruitful or if there needs to be, uh, uh, has to be more vigorous. And then, uh, and then also we might get an update on uh, from OHIA as to uh, how they're coming along uh, with the uh, health risk values. So those, those would be my, my suggestions. Okay, we will do. Rita, you're back again. Yes, one last thing. Um, 
even though Bill was not as supportive of my proposal as I would have hoped he would have been, I will wholeheartedly support <laughs> everything that he's brought up. And one of the things that I wanted to add to the uh, 219 report, uh, Derek, that uh, maybe uh, the staff can consider is providing any policy memos, because when Bill talked about that, uh, I think that's one of the issues that uh, there are policies that uh, engineering staff is relying on that are not re readily accessible to the public. Uh, for example, when they say that, you know, even though there's no increase in emissions um, and it's an administrative change, they still require a permit for that. Uh, those policies are not readily accessible. And so any policies that are being relied on to make these 219 decisions, um, I would certainly welcome that. And if we can include that in uh, in the report, that would be really appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Uh, David, do you have your hand raised again? Yes, thank you. Uh, wanted to echo Bill's comments about Section 185. I, I think that's something that would be helpful to vet since that was something we brought up at home rule, unless we have a venue for home rule, maybe it'd be uh, useful to, you know, focus on that for local government. And the other item that's becoming uh, an issue that would be useful to discuss is the um, South Coast implementation of EPA's uh, startup shutdown malfunction interpretation, which just came out recently. And that could be uh, significant for a lot of different folks. So if we could consider that or get an update from staff, that would be helpful as well. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Looks like we'll have plenty to do next year. Yeah. All right. Well, that's uh Brings us into that item. We'll go ahead and go on to the written reports. Any questions on the written report that's attached? Pretty straightforward. All right. We have any other business from any of our members? Any public comment uh, for general public comment? I uh, haven't seen any other hands raised outside of our group, but I'll ask one more time for general public comment. Hey, Paul, are there any? Uh, it looks like Paul Avala is actually in the attendee side. He probably should have been brought over to the regular side Oops. unless Paul Avala would like to speak but I don't see anything uh, Mr. Chairman or uh, yep uh, Paul Avala did you want to add any other comments uh, sorry we left you over there on the other wrong side of the room for a little while did you have a comment or in, on any of the other items that came forward earlier I think yeah. he's muted yeah I think you're still muted Paul and if there is anything or if anything you want to add to the calendar for next year, uh, if you want to reach out to Derek and uh, please let him know. All right. Well, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and conclude the meeting. Our next meeting will be uh, January 15th. Um, unfortunately, not at our favorite restaurant. So uh, just another regular Zoom meeting. Uh, again, sponsored by Your Kitchen. So. <laughs> All right, everybody. Everyone have a great holiday and uh, look forward to see you guys next year out of 2020. Happy Good holidays. holidays. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you Merry man. Christmas. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy Bye. Holidays. Hey, Paul, stay in the line. Got it. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Sounds good. You want me to grab uh, YouTube? Yeah, you can stop the YouTube.